This week's video is going to be, I'm going to talk about another camera, but I'm sitting here and it's a beautiful day outside and I'm hearing all my neighbors mow their lawns, the lawnmower is just buzzing back and forth behind me, and I just realized I probably should go my, mow my lawn. So let's go do that now. Okay. That's done. We got that out of the way. So now I'll start talking about, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is probably not uh, the appropriate wear for a video. Um, I was just trying to get a little sun on the shoulders, you know what I mean, getting ready for vacation and that kind of thing. So um, let's switch into something uh, much more appropriate. There we go. Okay, so now let's talk about this camera. This is what you guys were watching this video for anyway, right? You wanna hear about the Leica R3 Electronic Safari Edition. Yeah. Roll the intro. So let's talk about this camera. I picked this up a number of months ago and it wasn't really looking for one, but it looked like a pretty cool camera when I saw it. The price was reasonable, so I jumped on it. The Leica R3 is basically a poor man's Leica. If you want the Leica glass and a Leica build camera body, but you can't afford the ultra expensive M series Leicas than the R series, at least we'll let you experience a little bit of the Leica uh, enjoyment. This camera wasn't actually made in Germany, nor was this particular lens. Uh, the camera was made in Portugal. The lens was made actually in Canada. Uh, it's still a Summicron uh, F2 lens, and it's just as good as the M Summicron lens. It's just much larger. This particular one, it has a built-in hood, comes in and out. The camera itself, the camera body itself, was the first of this particular type of camera. And I did have, they did have a Leica Flex, a couple of Leica Flexes prior to this that took a similar lens, but this was the first one that looked like this of the R series, the first one of the R series, and this particular one is a special edition Safari Green. Uh, typically, these are black. Um, and maybe there there were some other editions, but I just I know there's black and I know there's this one that I have. Uh, the camera isn't terribly complicated, but it is electronic. It has a fully electronic shutter, and if we open the back, you can see it's probably really hard to see, but this isn't a cloth curtain shutter. This is a vertically traveling bladed shutter, a metal bladed shutter that travels up and down instead of side to side like a, the typical cloth shutter would. So a very well made, very well made shutter. This camera is, is a brick. It, it's got some heft, some weight to it. It's brass parts. It's very heavy um, compared to the M and some of the other SLRs of the day that had more plastic components and aluminum components. Uh, this one just has a lot of brass and, and it's just really a really heavy camera very very solid and very well built it does take batteries it takes two of the lr44 batteries very easy to find i can tell you at least from in the example i have here um, you better have batteries in it before you use it you really you really need batteries the manual says that you can use it at 1 90th of a second without batteries but i have not found that to be the case with this one yeah it will fire but I have found that many times the shutter itself won't open even though the mirror goes up and down. So I end up with blank. I ended up with some blank photos because the batteries were dead and I didn't know that. 
I put a new set of batteries in it and then the rest of the photos came out beautifully. At the end of this video, uh, I may throw a few black and white photos that I took on there, uh, just on Tri-X, uh, testing it out, playing around with it. I have a lot of film cameras, so I don't get to use them all as much as I'd like, but this one is definitely uh, a pretty fun one to use. Again, it's electronic, electronically controlled shutter, need batteries to run it, so just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, as if, you look, if we look at the top, it just has a single contact uh, X-Sync flash, uh, one sixtieth of a second, I believe, or maybe it's one ninetieth of a second. I, uh, I'm not really sure what the flash sync on it is. It just has an X-Sync for the flash on the, the shutter speed dial. It doesn't have a particular number um, to put it to. This camera actually has two metering modes as well. It has kind of a there's a little button right here. You can flip back and forth to switch between those two modes. There's like a, a kind of a center weighted metering and then a, a more wider um, center weighted average metering over, over the whole thing. Or I should say it's almost like a spot metering here versus a center weighted. So it has actually two metering modes, which was pretty advanced for the for the camera of its day. I mean, we're talking late 70s here, so it's pretty advanced for a late 70s camera. Other than that, we have the, the shutter button from rewind lever here again very solid there's also a another little item here in front of the film rewind lever that will let you do multiple exposures um, you can shoot and you can flip the switch and do more than one exposure on a single frame of film if you would like so that's another feature of this camera I'm gonna right here on the front is a standard uh, self timer we have our a little lever here for the uh, depth of field preview the switch button here to res lens release and then on the other side we also have our standard PC sockets for both the X and the M sync on this camera and again uh, this camera actually have has the covers on there as well which is pretty cool uh, that they, it still has that. On the back side of the camera we have a view split image viewfinder which is very nice uh, we have a little lever here that can shut the viewfinder if you don't want to risk light going through there and interfering with your photo. We have an on and off switch, which I would recommend you uh, remember to turn that on off when you're not using it. And then over here at the far right, frame counter is all the way over there. And then on the back door, we also have this one has the, the uh, a little yellow window. So when you have your film in there, you can see what film, that little window, what film you have in, the, in it. Um, one of the things about these, when I got this, I replaced the, f the piece of foam that goes around that because if that foam goes bad, then that's there's, there's a big potential for light leaks there if that foam is bad. But I put a new piece on it right when I got it. This I ha it happened to have a new piece with it the guy had not put on there yet. So I put that on first thing before I even tried it. It works great, totally light free. On this side, we have a red light for the battery test in light. So if that light lights up nice and red, you know you're good to go. Uh, top here is the battery test button. If we push that, the light's lighting up, so we know we got good batteries. On the top, film rewind dial. On the, the this side, we have, you set your uh, film speed, the rewind dial there, and then you can pull it to pop your door like any other camera like this. Um, rewind your film, you got a uh, compensation as well. So you, get, you, get, you set your film speed, and then you also have the ability to set compensation on this camera as well if you want. Um, personally, I'll just play with the film speed if I want to compensate or, or, or shutter speed or aperture or something else. Uh, and this really only applies if you're using, using the metering in the camera, which in this camera still seems to work pretty well, though I tend to rely predominantly on uh, external handheld meters uh, for all my cameras because I use so many different cameras. Um, I don't want to try to remember which ones are reliable and which ones aren't, so I just use a handheld meter for pretty much everything, unless I need something in a pinch. Uh, then I might try to uh, go with the hand, the meter or just go with the good old Sony 16 rule if I'm outside. I think we've talked uh, predominantly about uh, most of the things with this camera. It does have a little light, a little uh, light dot here on the top that let, allows light in for the metering. And also underneath the bottom, if I take the lens off here, 
Um, underneath here, there's a little window here, and this is a little magnifying window that lets you actually see what aperture the lens is set at, kind of a mechanical way of seeing the aperture through the viewfinder instead of a digital way, which is pretty pretty cool. That works really nice. Uh, and the same thing uh, for the shutter speed. It also has a mechanical shutter speed in there that, that turns along with the shutter speed dial and shows you where you are there. Let's see, are, is there anything else we need to talk about? This particular camera, again, it's in nice shape. There's a little bit of uh, leatherette and the corners are you know, starting to come up, but not, in, not anything worth going through the trouble of trying to glue back down at this point in time. Now, this particular one, uh, I do have the original strap for this camera, which, which is not bad, but this particular one I have added the uh, BART 1972 military green canvas strap just because I thought I think it looks so awesome with it. Um, and it's a little sturdier, uh, heavier duty strap as well, um, but it just looks fantastic with the Safari Green camera in and of itself. Uh, one final note about this camera is uh, it was made in, in a con conjunction with Minolta, a partnership with Minolta. So if you don't want to pay what one of these costs, because these, you know, these still are several hundreds of dollars, and especially with the lenses, I mean, you can look at, you'd be looking at six, seven, eight hundred dollars um, for this kit still yet. Whereas a lot of the other SLRs, Canons, and a lot of Nikon's and more common Olympus stuff, uh, you know, for a hundred or two hundred dollars, you can get a nice kit. But this kit is going to run you some uh, some money. It's not going to be like the M, but it's going to run you some money. Now, if you want this same camera without spending hundreds of dollars, you can pick up its Minolta counterpart. Because again, this was made in conjunction with Minolta. So they made a Minolta counterpart um, to this camera, Minolta did, uh, and it's the XE7. So if you pick up a Minolta XE7, it will look very, very, very similar to this camera, but you can probably get it for about 200 bucks. Granted, you're going to get the, you, it's going to have the Minolta mount. You're not going to fit Leica R lenses on there, but it'll have a, its own mount. But the camera in and of itself will look very similar to this camera. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one of those to show you, but uh, it is a very similar camera if you want to jump on eBay or whatever to Google and compare the two. Well, that's a quick rundown of the Leica R3 Electronic Safari Edition. Everything that I know uh, about this camera off the top of my head. And, uh, it's, it's an interesting camera to shoot with, fun camera again, a little heavy in the field, so not one you want to carry around a lot all day. Uh, but if you want to want a Leica, you don't want to spend thousands of dollars, but just hundreds of dollars, you can pick yourself up the R3 Safari Edition or uh, the R3 uh, non-Safari Edition in the black would be a, probably a little less expensive than this one since it, it was a more common camera. Anyway, thanks for watching. Peace.